the weekend, a yellow haze filled the air over parts of southern France and Switzerland. It wasn't because of local pollution, but because of something that happened hundreds of miles south in Africa's Sahara Desert. The AFP news agency reports that this region can release hundreds of millions of tons of dust every year. The smallest particles of it can travel hundreds of miles to places in Europe. A European forecaster says the amount that recently reached the continent is estimated to be twice what it's been in the past. So hazy skies and cars coated not with pollen, but desert dust were expected to bring a yellow tinge to parts of France until at least Sunday. Hi, I'm Carl Azus. Next stop today on the world from A to Z, a U.S. Commonwealth about a thousand miles southeast of the state of Florida. Puerto Rico has declared a public health emergency over a disease called dengue. It's spread by mosquitoes, specifically the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Dengue typically causes fever, rash, aches and pains, and nausea. U.S. health officials say most people infected don't have symptoms, and those who do typically recover within a week. So why did Puerto Rico declare a health emergency? For one thing, its health department says this island has seen almost 550 cases this year. That puts it on track to set a new record if dengue continues to spread at this pace. Severe cases of the disease can be deadly. There's no specific medicine or cure for those infected. And while there is a vaccine, Healthline.com says it's not widely available or approved everywhere, and the CDC says some vaccinated people can still get dengue anyway. There are between 100 million and 400 million cases yearly, according to the World Health Organization. Most of them occur in Brazil, and that's another place that's seen a dramatic increase in cases this year. Tropical weather that's warm and humid, which has been impacted across the region by last year's El Nino event in the Pacific, may be part of the reason for the increase. Flooded areas or even small pools of standing water are typically breeding grounds for mosquitoes and potentially the diseases they carry. In the United States, the biggest crane on the East Coast has arrived in the state of Maryland. The Chesapeake 1000 is a floating crane that can lift 1,000 tons at a time. It'll help remove pieces of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that was destroyed when a container ship crashed into one of its supports last week. The Army Corps of Engineers is now ready to start clearing hundreds of thousands of tons of twisted steel and concrete that's blocking ships from entering or exiting the Port of Baltimore. There is a massive steel truss bridge going across that channel. And at the bottom, 50 feet down at the bottom, there's also concrete, possibly some containers, other debris that we have to get off the floor. But it's a delicate operation. It's going to be a monumental task. This is going to be piecemeal, section by section, piece by piece, until they can excavate the entire area. What would you be most worried about if you were supervising the crane and this entire operation? Going too fast, meeting the expectations of the public to move too quickly. That section of bridge that's draped over the front of the vessel, that portion of bridge alone weighs 4,000 tons. My uh, most capable crane there is 1,000 tons. So we're at least going to cut that into four members. A major complicating factor for crews trying to break up the wreckage in manageable chunks, light. Imagine trying to do that 50 feet down in the dark uh, with a diving suit on, and we've got to do the same level of analysis on the bottom of that channel as we have to do for those members that are out of the water. And the cleanup work itself poses risks to the crane operators, divers, and crew. It is dangerous. There could be tipping of, uh, of the crane. So the balancing of the crane is most important. So when will the channel be open to shipping traffic? I don't think we're talking days. I don't think we're talking months. Once we get started, I think we're talking weeks. <laughs> On this date in world history. The U.S. House of Representatives met for the first time with a required quorum on this date in 1789. The chamber convened in New York, which was then the nation's capital, before it moved to Philadelphia and later Washington, D.C. Pennsylvania's Frederick Muhlenberg was elected as the first House Speaker. Apple was founded on this date in 1976 by Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne. 
The company's first Apple I computer sold for $600. Apple was nearly bankrupt in the 90s, but new products like iMacs and later iPods gave Apple new life, and it's now one of the most profitable companies on Earth. And former Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic was arrested on this date in 2001. He was transferred to an international criminal court where he was accused of genocide and war crimes for his actions during the conflict in Kosovo. Milosevic was found dead in prison before his trial wrapped up. Upper the knowledge. Pruritus is a medical term for what sensation? Itching, nausea, pain, dizziness. Pruritus is a term that's been used for centuries. It comes from a Latin word that means itching. You don't need to be a medical professional to know that scratching an itch can cause this constant cycle of temporary relief and then itching all over again. The simple sensation and response is part of a very complex process involving the skin, the brain, and stimulated nerve cells. And new research is helping scientists understand all of this and possibly develop better treatments for inflammation. If you feel itchy, whatever you do, don't scratch, because... It's a trap! Scratching an itch leads to a vicious cycle of itching and scratching. And about a decade ago, scientists discovered why. When you scratch, it causes minor pain. This prompts the brain to release serotonin, a natural chemical that has many functions in the body. One of which is mood regulation. Serotonin makes you feel good but it also reacts with the receptors on neurons that carry itch signals to the brain. So scratching, though it may bring short-term relief, actually makes itching worse. Mom's been right this whole time. But of course, researchers are never satisfied with what they know. They kept scratching the itch. And in October, scientists at UC San Francisco announced a discovery. The neurons that make you itch also help keep allergies and inflammation under control. When something irritates our skin, whether it's a chemical substance, allergies, or a skin condition, our bodies release a protein called IL-31. This is one of several itch cytokines, which triggers animals and people to itch and scratch. And apparently, IL-31 is a pretty good communicator because it not only talks to nerve cells to stimulate an itch, it talks to immune cells too and keeps them from overreacting and causing more widespread irritation and inflammation. In a study using mice, the critter's IL-31 protein was removed and they were exposed to a common allergen, dust mites. As expected, the result was no itching, but inflammation increased. The finding seems to answer why anti-itch drugs that block IL-31 can sometimes result in more inflammation. Without IL-31 talking to immune cells, those guys can run wild. According to the study's lead author, the idea that our nerves contribute to allergy and different tissues is game-changing. There is a lot more science ahead, but this latest discovery about IL-31's presence in the human body and its role opens the door to changes in how people with asthma, Crohn's, and other inflammatory diseases are treated in the future. The Cowboy State, the Equality State, Forever West, they're all nicknames associated with the state of Wyoming, and that's where Mrs. Will Meddy's class is watching from Rock Springs High School. Great to see y'all in the city of Rock Springs. Massachusetts has a lot of nicknames. We'll just go with the Codfish State because our catch of the day is Mrs. Connor's class at Whitman Middle School. Hello to the town of Whitman. Germany sprang forward to daylight saving time yesterday, the last Sunday in March, for a retired man named Werner Steckbart. That meant it was time to work. He normally has 365 clocks operating in his home. This year he has 366 because it's a leap year, and because none of them is connected to the internet, Steckbart adjusts each one himself. Now if you're asking why, he used to work for Lufthansa Airlines and flew all over the world. His mother, who often traveled with him, suggested buying a clock as a souvenir from the places he visited. And over time, it grew to a penulun-believable collection for a timekeeper who, regardless of whether he's a grandfather, is frozen in chime every hour on the hour and left in suspension twice a year when it takes more than a minute for the off-the-wall task of moving the hands of time. It's got to test his mantle, it's fun to watch, and it's a great way to wind up the world from A to Z. I'm Carl Azuz. Thanks for your time. I'm not April foolin' when I say you mean the world to me all the time.